So welcome to this session on using Docker and PowerShell called How to Develop Your Scripts with Confidence. A little bit of a background. Uh, I work for a company called Unity. We develop a game engine that runs across multiple devices and different platforms. So in our day-to-day -day work, we have to test our code in Linux, on Mac, and Windows, on Android, on iOS, Playstations, Xboxes, any device that you can imagine that runs graphical user interfaces, most of them have a Unity interface. So, so we have a lot of different people in the team that I'm in that runs a whole bunch of different OSs on their day-to-day -day laptops. And I'm more or less the only Windows guy. And still PowerShell is this new modern thing that nobody really want to touch. Uh, they can see the idea with it. But Bash has been around since 72 or however long, so that is still the weapon of choice for a lot of, of the, especially the Unix guys. Um, and I develop a lot of tools that can be used, and people didn't want to install it. Like, I'm not going to like infect my pristine Linux machine with something modern that comes from Microsoft. So, so we're going to reach this compromise that if I package my stuff up in Docker, they will be able to run the tooling without having to actually install stuff on their fancy Linux boxes or Unix boxes. So, so this is a little bit about the journey that I've been on. I haven't been using Docker for years. Um, so I'm going to show some of the, how I started out using Docker and testing scripts in Docker. How we, I'm going to end it up and how I'm testing it now on multiple different Docker container types. Uh, I'm quickly going to touch on like a CI system. I assumed a lot of people would show Azure DevOps, so I just chose GitLab uh, because I have some experience with GitLab and I like the way that it does the GitLab runners. So we'll go through deploying Docker containers, how you can edit and run uh, the Docker files, how you can edit scripts and actually execute them in the Docker containers. Uh, again, as I said, we have multiple different platforms, so I want to show you a way how to spin up multiple containers at the same time and run them with different container OSs. And just get some idea on how you can actually run scripts and collect results from them and do like a, a single report. So this is not a session on how to write PowerShell. This is not a session about running like tester tests. I have tester tests that I run. But it's very simple pester test. It's just to get the idea that you can actually run pester and have output and then collect that output and like share that in a single report. So how many people use Docker like on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, about less than a third. So we're going to start off with some Docker basics, uh, really about like what is Docker, how does, what is it? Like, Docker container, how to run scripts in containers, how can you actually execute things in these containers and in multiple containers. We're going to use Docker Compose for this uh, and Pester because it has really nice output. Thank you, Jakub. Um, then we're going to show some how you can actually plug this into a CI system. This can be any CI system, but I just chose GitLab. And then using the new VS Code remote development, uh, tool. Has anyone used VS Code remote development? No, oh, two. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're going to show you how to do that. I, there is a bunch of uh, example extensions that you can use and load, uh, but there were no PowerShell one, so I created a PowerShell one so you can get started and use PowerShell. Uh, we're going to go through how that works. But first, I just realized I did not plug in my computer. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I know my laptop has power for less than an hour. So, uh, so basic Docker. You have this concept of Docker images. So a Docker image is based off a file. And these files create, they use something called a union file system that create different layers. So the Docker files is basically a description of each of these layers. And these images is what will actually become a container. So when you run an image, 
at the time you instantiate the image, that is what you in theory call a container. So a container does not exist until runtime. So this is just the general description of like what is a Docker container or what is a container. So it's the standard unit of software that packages up code and all its dependencies so that applications can run quickly and reliable, reliably from one computing environment to another. So it also isolates the code between the container and the host. Isolates is in quotes because there are ways to break out of these uh, containers and into the host system. But since we're writing the code, we don't, we, we kind of trust it. The basic Docker architecture, you have a Docker client, which is just the Docker executable. It has a lot of parameters or you can run. Then you have the Docker host. I'm running Windows, so I have running Docker for Windows. That installs a Docker daemon, like a service that runs on Windows, that can execute and host these containers. I run Linux containers on my machines. You can also choose to run uh, Windows containers, but that you cannot run this, them both at the same time. They had a release last year where you could do that, but they've taken that feature away again. So, so right now, it runs on Hyper-V, and there's a Linux machine running in Hyper-V that actually runs all these containers. And then we have this concept of a registry. Docker is running one of the biggest registries. Microsoft runs their own registry as well. So the registry is a catalog of images. So if you don't have an image on your local machine, when you try to start up a Docker container, it will go to the registry, if you configured it, and say, hey, do you have an image? And then it will pull it down and then execute it. A little bit about the layers. Again, this is very basic Docker. You have a Docker file. The Docker file is the description of what you want your image to look like. So in this example, can't see the mouse. Oh, you can there. So this Docker file says, I want to inherit from the Ubuntu image. Then I have a maintainer tag that is actually being deprecated. So um, it's not needed anymore. And then you run the commands that you, you need in order to set up your environment. So in this example, I'm making a directory and I'm running app get install curl. So that means in the end, my final image will consist of four layers. So I have the base layer, which is the actual image. It's from the Ubuntu, so you can see it's actually kind of turned around. And then layer one is just a description. So that is going to be a very thin layer that has a maintainer. Layer two will have just the make directory. And then the layer three will have the actual files that when it installs curl. So there are things to think about when you create your Docker file. Because each of these layer is basically a file in the union file system. So all these is, is a bunch of files that get connected into a single file system. So you have to think about how you want these layers to be, because otherwise you can risk up getting very, very big files. So when you need to share this with your colleagues or whoever on the internet, then you'll have huge files. Uh, you don't want to share a gigabyte file if you can share a 300 megabyte file, right? So it's important to group similar commands so you'll often see people for Linux images using the ampersand ampersand uh, to group different commands because one command goes into one layer. So everything that doesn't make sense to split up, like app get update and app get install, it doesn't make sense to have that in different layers because one layer would just, when you run app get update, it'll just update its sources file. So you'll have one layer that just has an updated sources file and then you'll actually install software on the next layer. File copies, uh, copy only a single file or directory at a time for granularity. Um, also copy files as late as possible in the Docker config file because Docker cannot guarantee the contents of all files that you copy in. So if you have a copy, it'll have to redo everything below it. We'll see that as an example. Again, clean up in the same layer. So if you have something that downloads a big file, 
then clean it up. I do the RM. I download the app.target.gz file. I clean that up in the same layer. So if I download a zip file, I unzip it, and I wait until the next layer to delete it, then the initial layer will both have both the zip file and the extracted zip files. So that means that, that in theory, that folder would be twice the size, that layer would be twice the size. So again, string your commands together if it makes sense, like this, run this, instead of having it in three different lines. That will use much less space doing it this way than doing it this way. Demo time. That was the wrong one. Let's actually just open this just for... So this is the Docker Hub. And of course, I chose the PowerShell repo. So you can see here that Microsoft has, of course, they have all sorts of packages on the uh, official Docker Hub. But you can see here that Microsoft is actually hosting their registry themselves in Azure. Uh, yes, I can. So, so you can see here, this is the list of Docker images. First, they have all the Windows images. And you have like the different versions on Alpine and CentOS and Fedora and Ubuntu and whatever different containers. We're going to run a few of these uh, soon. So, and if, if you go to the Docker Hub, you'll find, I don't remember the exact amount. They used to have this on the front page somewhere. They don't. But there are hundreds of thousands of different images, and you can upload your own images if you need to share images with the world. One thing to be aware of is the tagging system. So when you tag something, a lot of them get tagged as latest. Uh, but if you download, if you download latest a week ago, then Docker will store that locally. And if Microsoft, for instance, upgrade an image, and you'll say, hey, Docker pull latest, it'll say, oh, you already have latest. So it doesn't actually go and check if there is a newer latest. <laughs> so, so this has bitten me a few times. Uh, we'll see this in action here. I don't know why there's a seven, but let's do this. So this is the list of Docker images that I have on my machine. Can we do this? So we can see it all. Can you still see it in the back if I do like this so it's just easily readable? So this is just showing the list of images that I have on my machine, machine right now. So if I do Docker run PowerShell latest, I would expect this to be PowerShell version 7 preview 1. Version table. Oh, I didn't do minus it. Yeah. So you'll actually see this is PowerShell 6.2, and this was because I pulled latest two weeks ago. So it's, it's very important when you do your Docker files that you specify versions. Uh, and use the specific version that you actually need. And I don't know in PowerShell, uh, in the VS Code, I always get this bracket. And when I do my first delete, I get this. And then I can actually go, Docker has this thing called history. So you can actually inspect all the images. This is an image that is pulled from the, uh, the Docker repo or the Docker registry. So you can actually see what has been done in this image. So this is what Microsoft has done to actually build this image. And you can see each layer size. So you can see the base is 102 megabytes, and then the different layers going up there. And it says that the layer is missing out here. 
That's because it has been collapsed when you share it. So it's, it's collapsed into a single file, but you can still see the history, what has actually gone into it. So if I wanted to run the latest image, which is the preview one, I'm doing Alpine because that's the smallest image. So it'll say, hey, I'm unable to find the image locally on your machine. So I'm just going to go to the Docker registry and pull it down for you. So that means that now I will have this image. It says it's a download of the latest version. I didn't specify minus IT, which is interactive. So it just runs the container. And if the image doesn't have anything specified to run, it'll just exit. So this is, this is quite important that you kind of specify what version that you want. Otherwise, you get into all sorts of weird things. So how do we create our own containers? We have a super simple Docker file. Again, the Docker file is the description. And again, I do not adhere to back practice, what I was just telling you about. So here, I use latest. And the tag latest will give me 6.2. Adding a maintainer, deciding like what's the starting directory inside the container. I just put that as root. Then I say, hey, what kind of shell do I want? And I can do like, this is where all the subsequent run commands, they will run in that shell. So I've chosen that it should be PowerShell. And I'd like to add like error action preference to stop. Usually I also, when you install modules, because of the way uh, output is handled, I also disable the uh, progress bar, but not in this example. So I set the PS gallery as trusted, and I install a module. Let's not install Pester, that takes a little while. So, so this is a simple description. So this takes, goes up to Microsoft, pulls the PowerShell latest, if I don't have it already, and then run these commands. So this will basically run two commands, one that says PS repository, PS repository is trusted, and one that installs the Slack module. We just need to switch location. This is a Docker command for building. So I say Docker build minus T is the name of the container. So the container is going to be called psconf, and dot is just look for a Docker file in your current directory or you could specify the full path to the Docker file. So let's see what this does. So you can actually see what it does. It does six layers. See the one layer, maintainer. And it actually had already built all of these things. So it can reuse all the layers. So it actually didn't go and do anything in this example because I already had these different layers, so it knew what to do with it. So if I go and change the Docker file, we can, you can actually go and see that it's here. Uh, it's not very easy to see. Let's do this. Yeah. Just being zoomed in like that is quite hard to see, but you can see there's one that's called psconf copy, and it's somewhere up here. I'm going to look for it. So if we go and change the Docker file, let's say we want to install Pastor, we can rebuild the Docker container. We can just remove it. We're going to rebuild it. So I actually, while I tested it, that's sometimes that making Docker demos hard because I tested this and wanted to make sure that it worked. But that means that on my machine I now have a layer that installs Pastor. So I actually have to go and find another. So let's do Piscribo. I know I haven't tested that. So we'll see, oh, actually, it figured out it already had Slack. It already had the Pesta module, but it didn't know layer 8. So now it actually has to run something and install something in layer 8, which is just Piscribo. And this is the output that I'm talking about with the uh, progress bar. It doesn't get handled very well. For bigger modules, it'll just scroll on and on for a long time. So I tend to like to say I don't want to see the progress bar. So now I have a container that has PS Slack, Pastor, and Prescribo. 
that I can use. Let's just clean this up. I can go into the history, the container name. Let's see this. So you can actually see all the history. This is what Microsoft did when they published the image. And we have all the layers, the eight layers that were needed to run and add the stuff that I just showed. You can also do Docker inspect if you need to see more, like more detailed information. That will give you detailed information about the networks and the different layers and the SHA values of the layers. Not going to go into that detail. Again, we briefly saw this when I tried to run it. It'll start up and it'll exit immediately because there's no command that it runs. So if you want to run it, you have to run it with the minus IT, which is interactive. This will not work in the ISE. It'll just make ISE hang. So don't try that. And this will just drop me to a shell. Or I can do a PS version table. And see, so we're on 6.2. Again, the minus T is just the name. So if I wanted to build a new container, I could just make a new container called psconf2. The way we do it, we have an internal registry that we share images internally in the company. So that will just get published there. So, but how do you get your files into the actual container? So, Oh, yeah. That actually uh, works sometimes. You can see it actually, it actually went and did it. So it, it is one of those things like GitLab uses Docker and Docker. So it uses Docker to host other Docker containers. So you have a Docker host that hosts Docker containers that host other Docker containers. You can run Docker and Docker and Docker. Docker on top. Now, so let's see, how do we actually get our own files in here? Like, let, let's say I was developing a script. I'm just going to clear out of this. So I have this very advanced script that I want to test. So I have this hello from container script. I have a Docker file. Again, bad practice using PowerShell latest. And I have this demo script. Let me switch directories. So I'm going to build a new Docker container called psconf copy. So this container is already built because of, of time constraints. I'm going to run the container. And you'll see it actually outputs hello from container. And we can look in the Docker file. And we can see that we do the same. We have the shell, the PowerShell command, set the repository as trusted install the module, we copy the file, my script, into the root directory of the container, and then we add the folder, and Docker has this concept of entry points. So an entry point is one way of actually executing code inside the Docker container. So this tells the Docker container, every time you start, you're going to run that script, and you're going to run it in this shell command. So it knows it will have to run with PowerShell. If I had set bash up here, it would just fail because bash doesn't know what a PS1 file is. So we run the container. And it seems as if my Integrated shell has decided to have problems. So it tells me that it's deprecated. Let's try and run it again. So even though I specified the interactive flag, it didn't stay in the container because entry point overrides that. So if you have a script that uses entry point to execute something, you have to override it. So in this command, I say docker run interactive override entry point with pwsh, which is just the PowerShell shell, and the container name. 
So if I wanted to go in here and edit something, I could do that. So now I'm in my container. I've overridden the entry point, And now I can do like a dir. So you can see I have a directory called more important. And I have the important file and I have my script. And that is one of the things you'll see here when I do, I add test folder. So it's actually not going to add the test folder. It's going to add everything inside the test folder. So if we expand this, you'll see this is where the more important folder comes from and the important text file comes from. So this is one thing to be aware of. When I, I wrote this, I was kind of like, ah, oh, why isn't, don't I have the top level directory? Yeah, but that's the reason why. So let's say I wanted to change my script here. And I'm going to add um, container 42. So we're going to run it again. But it still says hello from container. So any idea why it didn't run that? Why didn't it say 42, like I changed the script file to? I have to rebuild the container, yes, because the container is static. So you have to build the container again. So that is not a very efficient way uh, to actually test this. I'm going to run it. Now it's going to say hello for container 42. So, so this is quite an annoying way of doing it. And that's where volumes is quite helpful. So you can map your local file system into these Docker containers. So you can, in theory, edit the file yourself. And um, then the file will just be there. Sometimes it gives you some extra files. You can see I run bash. So bash creates like a bash history file. So that's if you do like git or something, you probably want to git ignore file to ignore not checking in all these artifacts. So we do test folder close and we do demo. So we just run the PS uh, conf container again, the one we showed initially. There are no, there are no files in there in the root directory. So we exit. And the minus V switch is what says here map this folder. So what we say here is map this Windows file system path into the root folder of this container and run PWSH. So now if we do dir, we can actually see that it mapped in everything. And if we do, uh, I can do, uh, you can even switch out to bash and do ls. And you can see that the other files are there. You switch out to back to PowerShell. So you can see that the actual files are there. And you can do cd test folder. You can see, oh, there's my script in here. I can execute that. Let's hello from my container again. So we will go into test folder, directly edit the script, and we'll say, hey, something, something, something. And we can run my script again, and that will be updated. So that was, that is one of the ways that I've been kind of developing code when I did this initially. Uh, so you, can, you cannot access the file system directly from the container unless you map it in. And it's actually a permission that you explicitly have to give Docker, that Docker is allowed to expose these folders onto you. So, but in theory, you could map your root of your C drive in if you wanted to. And if, if I create a file, uh, like something, and I did out file, test.txt, then it would create that file right here. So, so you can write both ways. But that, I would say, with the new VS Code remote extension uh, that is coming up, I would, that is a definitely a new way that I will be working on, or like working going forward. This is only available in the, uh, in the preview at the moment. 
I know this is black. It's part of the demo. Um, so right now, it says, hey, you don't have the PowerShell extension installed. Do you want to install it? Because this is the PowerShell script. So let's try and open a folder that is actually set up to be one of these uh, uh, new remote container storages. So we do psconf, VS Code, remote try PowerShell. So it's actually going to say in a little while, it's gonna say, the PowerShell extension is not installed. Oh, this is the dev container. Would you like me to reopen that in the dev container? And notice out here that I don't have the PowerShell extension installed or anything. So let's say reopen in container. And just remember that um, it's also the PowerShell extensions like they give you the ice theme. So this is running a Docker container. It's setting up a bunch of things. Docker exec allows you to execute stuff inside the Docker container. So what the extension does is just copy a bunch of things into a Docker container and execute it. And now you'll actually see on my local instance of VS Code, I now have the uh, PowerShell extension installed. But it's still not installed on my local machine. It is actually installed inside the Docker container and it's exposed through the VS Code server extension inside the Docker container. So even something as themes is exposed. So you can see here, I can actually switch to the PowerShell ice theme, even though I don't have it installed. So if I open a different folder in uh, VS Code now, and it'll actually also overwrite because it maps the Docker container file system into VS Code. So when you try to open a new file, it'll actually say, do you want to open stuff inside the container or do you want to show local paths? So if I were to change, like, take another folder. Don't save. Then you'll see I actually don't have the PowerShell and I don't have the theme anymore, so I don't have ICE. So this you can do more or less anything on ICE the remote server and it will come up to your local client. So this is an, a very easy way to share the development environment. Just quickly going to open this again so you can see the files. Reopen the container real fast. Mm -hmm. It feels like you're working. It, it takes a little while extra, as you can see here, because it has to copy over the Docker file every time. Oh, oh sorry. No, he was asking if there was any latency uh, working inside the Docker container. It takes a little while to get it started, so it takes about 20 to 30 seconds, depending on the complexity, uh, or if you have to build the container. So the first time, it will take a longer time to run. Uh, but otherwise, I haven't experienced any latency. I haven't run huge, huge scripts. Again, you need to have support for whatever is running inside the container. But the way you do it is you have this .dev container file that has a Docker file. Again, this is just basic Docker file, setting the PS uh, gallery trusted. I install Pester. I do some OS updates. I clean some things up. Uh, you have this dev container configuration file. This is what is being used by the server side extension. So in this, this very simple example, I just tell it to install the uh, Power, PowerShell extension from the uh, VS Code gallery. So that is what actually brings this up. It complains that I don't have Git, for instance. I don't have Docker. So I could just add a list of Git and Docker here, and it would install it. It is actually also operating on the file system. Sorry, if, sorry, uh, if, how do I make sure that the changes you make inside the containers are actually reflected in the file system? But it maps the file system out so the changes will actually be in your Git repo. So if I go in there and change the file, it will actually also 
be changed in your local file system because the directories are mapped in there. So when you're done working, you'll actually just do a git commit. No, but that is, we can see some of the stuff that it's actually doing here. Uh, dev containers. So it, it actually does a lot of things in the background. For some reason, I can't scroll in this now. I have a video that is in the, uh, in the slide deck where you can see this and there is markings. I don't know why I can't go up in this. But you can actually see how it does everything, that it copies files over, that it maps stuff. Like in this example, you can see it runs Docker exec. So it runs the VS code server stuff. And that does, does all this plumbing for you that sets these things up. We can go into more details afterwards. Any more, no more questions? So this is, this is really cool. And I think this is really useful. It, it supports containers at the moment. Uh, I've seen it maybe 10, 15% of the time. It will fail setup, but then you'll just do like rerun container and it usually works. You can do SSH connections to remote servers and say, Hey, uh, run the code there or connect to it and start the server up there. Oh, that's actually the video. I'm not gonna play that now. Now they actually saw it. Gonna do. So this is, we're gonna go into how to do more containers. Uh, I can see we're a little short on time. So, we have this container that we created previously. We're just gonna run that again. So now I have a directory. Uh, here, I know the zooming is not very good. I have some, there's a, directory called Docker files and HTML and unit test folder and a bunch of scripts just to give you the idea of the structure you can see it here as well we have the docker demo file so this is the crazy insane PowerShell code that we're going to use for this entire demo so this is just a function called new docker demo creates a folder creates a file sets some content in a file and there are some basic Docker uh, pester tests that actually test that the file exists, that the content in the file is what I expect it to be, and it just tests connection to your local host. And you'll see why we do the test connection. So now here I have mapped the volume into the OS, so I can do dir, I cannot do. And I can do invoke pester. And it will run the pester tests that are in this folder. So it's just going to describe the thing and it's going to say everything's fine. We also have to test a lot of legacy stuff around work. So we have this, this is a CentOS box with one of the early betas of PowerShell core. Don't remember the exact version. It is 6.00 slash alpha. So very old version. And if I do invoke pester, I don't know why it returns twice. But pester doesn't really work on this version really well, so it'll come up with a bunch of errors. So, so sometimes you'll have, like, if you, if you have to test on old stuff, you'll have stuff that doesn't really work. I'm just gonna control C out of that. So, Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a way to orchestrate your Docker containers. How many is familiar with Docker Compose? Okay, about the same amount as people, uh, that we're using Docker. So there is something about the versions. So the YAML file down here is dependent on what tags you can use on the version. Uh, version 3 is, is about a year old, I think. Uh, so that is pretty standard. 
you define different services. So in this case, I'm saying, hey, I want an Alpine image. I want you to pull the image from Microsoft, where I specify the version. So I'm running 6.2. And you have this variable that will just say, hey, map this volume to the directory where you're getting executed from. So I'm going to execute Docker Compose up from the command where these files are, and it'll automatically fill these things in. And I'm going to run this command. I'm going to run the run PS1. You see here I've had to double uh, dollar sign this in order for, to make this work. And then I install Pester. And then I run Pester, and I output it at NUnit XML, and I output it to a specific file. So that means that these files, even though I run them on a Docker container locally, the files, because of the map volume, will show up in the actual repo. I'm going to test Ubuntu 16.04, Ubuntu 18.04. I'm going to do CentOS 7. And then I'm going to do the CentOS beta. You can see the difference here is that I actually specify, instead of just saying, hey, pull this image from public, I specify a Docker file. That is because there is no more images. Microsoft has removed all the images of all the beta versions, so they're no longer accessible. Uh, so I had to create one myself that just goes and actually pulls the binary for uh, that was the oldest version that I could find on GitHub, uh, just for testing purposes. Now I'm going to... Where were you were there? So this is an example of you're actually telling it not to pull an image, but you're actually telling it to build a specific image. Again, the context is where to start. The Docker file is the specific name. And again, this is the command that you tell it to run. And then I have this final reporter. Again, I built a custom uh, Docker file here that has mono in it because I like to use a tool that's called report unit uh, to do take my pasta tests and collect all of them together, convert them into a nice HTML page. So in this example, we're going to do just test runner here. Uh, you can do Docker Compose up. That will go through and read the Docker Compose YAML file. Let's do this. So you can see now it's actually starting up six different containers. It starts up CentOS, beta, uh, beta, Alpine, Reporter, CentOS, Ubuntu 16.04, 18.04. So now it's going to attach to all these containers. And it's going to run the uh, the run script. It's just outputting a PS version table, OS version, uh, or asking, am I really here? So it doesn't really discern uh, PowerShell core if it's on a specific Linux version. It just say Unix for everything. So now it's actually running the pester things and running the tests in the background. And we'll start seeing that we go up here, that the end unit files are coming in. So you'll see it'll actually create, this is the result of the PESTA test that have been run in each container. For some reason, this is a little bit slow now. You'll see, as we saw before, it actually fails, it gives an error in the CentOS beta package. Um, I wouldn't expect Pesto to work in, in the beta version, so that is uh, expected. So now it's just running all the tests. And these files, you can see they slowly get modified because they are rewritten as the tests are rerun. That is running in parallel. Uh, you can see sometimes the the output is is mixed up together. Uh, so that is also why the reporting step, I decided to do that in a Docker container. Uh, I just have this as that it actually has to wait for two minutes before actually, you can see here, I just called sleep 
for 120 seconds. That's inside the Docker container. That's before it starts generating the HTML reports. So now it takes all the end unit reports from Pastor and it generates the HTML report. So you can see under HTML now, we have an HTML report for each of them, but we also have this index. Uh, I have that in a browser. I did not have that in that browser. I have it in this browser. Refresh it. So we can actually see an overview of all the PESTA tests that ran in all the different container images. Uh, I cheated a little bit. I didn't run it on Windows and Windows Core this time. So I can see Alpine, CentOS, oh, the CentOS beta that had one test that failed. And it was actually the test connect because the ping command or test connection command did not exist before PowerShell was released in, in 6.0 full version. So this way I can gather all this data and actually run it and see the result joined together as one report. So we use this quite heavily for other things. We do infrastructure tests as well that runs different tests and you can get a good overview of what has failed and then you can dig into each of them and say, hey, okay, this was good and this was good. In the beta that's failed, you can actually go over here and press this and you can say, hey, test connect should exist. And you can actually see, if you could read from that far back, that it says the term test connection is not recognized as the name of the commandlet because it just simply didn't exist. So this gives us a really good overview. I, I use, still use this at times when I need to test something quick locally on my own machine. Most of the time, though, I put it into to CI. Um, we use multiple different CI systems at Unity. Uh, because we do quite a lot of bills um, on our, like our main products. We do about, I think we're closing in on 400,000 bills a month and running about a billion tests every five or six months now. So, so that's a little bit different scale. And we went and talked to different CI providers and all of them pretty much says, please don't, please don't choose us. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we considered buying one. Uh, but in the end, we decided that we we would try to create our own. So, and we had this guy that said, I can do this in F sharp. And it's, uh, I don't know if anyone does functional programming. Okay, but it's, uh, yeah, that's another discussion. <laughs> so, so what I went and did for the CI part for this demo, I set up a free account on gitlab.com. Uh, we have no affiliation with them. Um, and you can kind of use what you've learned from the Docker files, um, uh, the Docker Compose file. So it's, it's kind of similar. It uses a base image. So I just say the base image should be PowerShell. I say when you run, you should use the overlay two driver. There are multiple drivers for the file system. And the DIMD is Docker in Docker. Uh, so use Docker in Docker. You define different stages. So I have stages that actually runs the tests. And I have the, the last build stage. In this example, it just build the PESTA test report. So what I say here, I have a Windows 10 machine. It's part of the test stage. I tag it with Windows 10. This is the definition of the runners you have. So when you install a runner, so you can install runners on different OSs and you give them a tag, so the Win10 just tells it you use the Win10 runner. I want it to collect artifacts, so everything that the command outputs, you can say get everything from a specific folder. Using the untracked true means that it'll go and do a git compare, and it'll say, hey, all the files that were added into the repo in this machine, I will take them out and use them as artifacts. I tell it to keep it a week, it should always do this. Uh, it should do reports. I never quite got that to work because it has a JUnit report thing. And you can have as many lines of script as you want to run. So I execute the run.ps1. I run install pester. And I invoke pester. And just for fun, and I had completely forgotten how painful this was, I wanted to make it work on XP. 
Oh, I, I regretted that. But uh, when you start something, you can't really. Uh, so I had to get Git working on Windows XP, and I had to get the GitLab runner to work on XP, and don't do it. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, so in this example, I, I do it on Windows 10, a Windows XP machine. Uh, I'm doing it in a Docker container. I'm doing it on a Docker Ubuntu 18. And then I have this build step. Again, I'm running this on Windows 10. I am creating a test results folder. I am copying all the XML files into that folder. And then I run report unit. And this is just the a put them in the same folder kind of a thing. And I say to make sure, since this is in different steps, I actually don't need the dependencies. But I can say, hey, don't run before you're certain that all of these are run. And then I take all the HTML artifacts and upload those. So if I make a change to that repo, which I've done because I reran it, so I can do git commit, demo time. I can do push, git push. So now I've made these changes, I've pushed them up to the repo. And we have projects here. So we have my Docker test repo. And we can actually see out here, we have something called CICD, have pipelines. You can see down here, a lot of them failed because I played around with XP. So you can see they're running. And here you can actually see the structure that it runs the four of them simultaneously and it waits for them to, to do the build part. So this way it's easier to make sure that everything is um, done in order. We tried some GitLab in the company and so we had some guys like, oh, we need to try this. And they ended up having, I think it was about 60 layers and about 5,000 steps in a single build. Uh, so they had created tooling to automatically generate this. So, so we can actually see it ran fine on Windows XP, it's still running on the Docker containers, but on the Windows 10 machine, the job is stuck because you don't have an actual runner online. Okay, what could that be? So I actually just run two VMs, just, and I, one of them gets gets paused, so we can see, now I'm going to unpause it. This, this is just a Windows 10 machine that has the agent installed, that GitLab runner installed. So it's restoring the state, and then when that is done, it usually takes a few seconds, then it'll immediately pick up the job and it'll run the job. Any questions while we wait for this super exciting bar to move to the right? <laughs> just, just for uh, like, da da. <laughs> I, I, I can reboot it if we had share. Oh, okay. <laughs> I actually considered doing like a demo and having it boot up and have the Windows XP sound play, but uh <laughs> so you can see now it's actually picked up the job and it's running it. So. Uh, yeah, the PS version table tag does not exist on PowerShell v2. And uh, by the way, there are a lot of dependencies, or several dependencies on .NET and uh, .NET 2 updates that you need to do in order to uh, get PowerShell v2 working. So you'll actually see that it's run. And you can see the pipelines here. And it's still running. And now it's actually done, so you can see the build window step. And you can see out here, it took the five HTML files it found, and it's put them into the artifact store that's built in. So you can see here the test results for this. Uh, you can download it. You can do, can't do that looking at there. That's the most annoying thing, is that it doesn't display HTML directly. You can set up GitLab pages, so you can publish them there. Uh, but we actually internally, instead of using it here, we just publish them to a website. 
We publish the results to Slack. So we push everything to Slack for notifications. And then we upload the file to an internal web server. So we have history. Um, so yeah, this is the... Pester actually runs on Windows XP and PowerShell v2. So I don't think there should be any breaking changes to Pester. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you, Jakob. <laughs> Just kidding. But yes, break it. It was so painful to install Windows XP that I totally agree that we should not use uh, PowerShell v2 anymore. Yeah, well, yeah, he, he asked me if why I didn't install it on Vista. Uh, well, I'm a masochist at times, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you. Uh, I hope you found some of this useful. Uh, we're going to do this. I just... So the summary, I hope you'll be able to like, at least get some ideas on how you can test your scripts across multiple different OSs, uh, how to use Docker Compose to instantiate multiple containers. All of this will be uploaded so you can see the examples. Again, most of you will probably use the CI platform. And then the leverage VS Code for remote development is really, really cool. Slides and demos, go there. Last chance for questions. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm.